Before the video gets started, I just want to give you all a quick disclaimer that I'll be discussing spoilers for Deadpool and Wolverine, so if you haven't seen the movie yet, this is your spoiler warning. And with that, let's get right into the video. What is going on everyone, and welcome to the channel. So we know that the MCU's mutant debut is imminent, mainly only a matter of time. We did get confirmation that Iman Vellani's Kamala Khan is the first mutant in the MCU, and we also saw Lashana Lynch's binary in the Marvels alongside Kelsey Grammer reprising his role as Hake McCoy, aka Beast. But I am talking about the mutant homecoming that we are all anticipating to see. To me, my X-Men. If you're new around here, go ahead and hit subscribe. We are so close to hitting 2400 subscribers, and my goal is to hit that by the time that Deadpool Wolverine releases on July 26th. With all the success of X-Men 97, Marvel and Kevin Foggy both know that we need to surpass what has come before, and the live-action debut for the X-Men needs to shine, just like it had done with X-Men 97. I'm hopeful that we will get the X-Men and the MCU before Secret Wars, but if anything, it'll probably happen after that, leading us away from the multiverse saga and into the mutant saga. This video is going to be broken down into parts, and we're going to move into part one, and that is the story. For the introduction to our X-Men, we need to hit it off with a bang. How do you do that? Well, starting with the story and the writers. If it wasn't clear enough to Marvel, they need to keep the team that had worked out X-Men 97 to lay the groundwork for what is to come. We need to be introduced to all of our characters, but they already need to be established. No more origin movies, no more backstories. This group of X-Men that needs to already be established and a part of Xavier School. The main X-Men need to already be in their 30s, and honestly, I think the main story points for the characters need to have happened in the past off-screen. For example, Logan getting his adamantium skeleton, Jean Grey becoming the Phoenix, and Magneto being the Holocaust survivor. Those storylines and character arcs need to already have happened so that we can tell new stories as well as stories that haven't been adapted in live action yet. We also need to have absolute points, or as Across the Spider-Verse had called them, canon events. These events would happen across every universe and it's irreversible. For example, Captain Stacy's death, Eddie Brock becoming Venom, Inspector Singh's death, Uncle Ben's death, and Spider-Man being bitten by a radioactive spider. For our X-Men absolute point, it would have to be the destruction of Geonosha. We have yet to see Geonosha in live action. No. Not this excuse that we had gotten in X-Men Dark Phoenix, the actual Geonosha. This needs to be an island that is believable to be its own country and can truly be a safe haven for our X-Men. Geonosha needs to be destroyed in our world, in every world. That would be our irreversible event, our absolute point, our canon event. And you might be asking, why Geonosha? Well, in episode 5 of X-Men 97, we can see the Watcher looking over Geonosha right before it's about to get destroyed. This is leading me to believe that this would be our canon event. Who was behind the destruction of Geonosha? Well, that can change. It doesn't need to be Bastion. It doesn't need to be Mr. Sinister. It doesn't need to be Cassandra Nova. It could be someone as small as Trask or as big as the Scarlet Witch. It's up to the writers to decide who the villain would be, but as long as it's true to the story and these characters that we all know and love. But my pick for the villain would be Mr. Sinister. Now I know that we had just gotten Mr. Sinister in X-Men 97, and I want you to know that this isn't going to be just a retelling of the season that we had previously gotten. I think Mr. Sinister was more or less used as a joke and a punching bag in the show, which was fine, I liked it, but Mr. Sinister throughout the previous Fox X-Men movies was teased and never really came to the light in the way that he should have been introduced, and the way he should have been introduced would have been through horror. Mr. Sinister in X-Men 97 really never had that true horror factor. My version of him would heavily lead into the horror aspect of his character and would be truly haunting the X-Men and would be their greatest threat yet with his mutant experiments. Mr. Sinister would be a lot like Mephisto in this movie and would be responsible for creating the Morlocks, which would tie into Geonosha. This would also help bring Morph into the story. With this, the X-Men wouldn't already be established in our current 616 universe. This group of X-Men would come from the ending events of Secret Wars where our new 616 universe would finally get the family of X-Men and the entire population would be getting exposed to the mutant gene. But only a certain amount would be able to unlock their genetic mutation and become mutants from it. You might be asking, how would the mutant gene even get here in the first place? Well, from Battle World. When the universes ended up colliding, bits and pieces from each universe would be merged into ours. With that, that's how we'd also get our Fantastic Four. I'm also going to be taking the plot point for Alkali Transigen from Logan, but instead, it wouldn't be Transigen, it would be the Pingo Dose Soda from the 2008 Incredible Hulk movie. I'm going to be adding this in that due to it going to be a factor in Deadpool and Wolverine and will easily tie into the Secret War story. This would be how the population gets affected, but only the people with genetic mutations in their DNA, like Kamala Khan and Monica Rambeau, would start to assume their powers and their mutations would start to form. 
Unlike Transigen, however, it does wouldn't be killing mutants and wiping them out. It would be creating mutants, populating the 616 universe with them. This would also end up becoming a plot point for this movie, and it would be surrounding around the House of M storyline with Wanda Maximoff. And we would get the No More Mutants line. To move on past this point in the story, we will need to go over our current X-Men lineup, and the cast for these characters along with what kind of character they are truly going to be. Mainly their objective, thoughts, and the way they express themselves. For example, Scott Summers in this movie won't be bowing down to Wolverine. Scott will be the strong leader that we all know him from in X-Men 97, and he will not be a sideline joke like he was in the Fox universe. I feel like the underutilization of Scott was huge, with the original three X-Men movies as well as the reboot. Scott's death won't be a plot point due to the actor having scheduled on conflicts with another film. Yes, that is the reason why Scott was killed off in X-Men The Last Stand. Not to serve a purpose or a true meaning to the story, but because James Marsden was having scheduling conflicts. That will not be the case with our movie. Our main X-Men lineup is going to be Professor X, Storm, Wolverine, Beast, Jean Grey, Cyclops, Rogue, Gambit, Nightcrawler, and Magneto. Although Magneto won't be in the true lineup, he will be a part of the team and he will be busy dealing with the Genosha side of things. As well, Kurt Wagner with Nightcrawler, would be a supporting role, and would be there for some of the missions and story points, but would also be absent from others. There would also be other mutants around, like Jubilee, Iceman, Magic, Archangel, Psylocke, Havoc, Morph, and Pyro. Those are just a few to name, but there are going to be plenty of mutants around that we all know. Now for the casting. Our first character on this list is going to be Scott Summers, aka Cyclops. The biggest question with that is, who can fill the shoes of Scott? Who can bring justice to this character, and who can really make them shine? My answer? Well... Zac Efron. Before you click off the video and leave a comment about how this is the worst casting that you've ever seen, just hear me out. In the Iron Claw, Zac Efron was able to go to so many places as Kevin Von Erich and truly gave an Oscar-worthy performance. With how well he played that character, he can easily do justice to Scott Summers and give us that leader that we all know Scott is and that we so desperately need to see on the big screen. How will Zac look at Scott Summers, you might be asking? Well, Take a look at Scott from X-Men 97. Look at his face shape, his chin, his jawline, and overall how his face and head fit into the suit. And now look at the same image, but this time, he has been replaced with Zac Efron. The parallels are here. Zac not only looks like Scott, but also feels like Scott. And from this photo, I can 100% say that Zac Efron is the perfect person to play Scott Summers. This would be perfect for Zac's career, and also part of his redemption arc. I think Zack's redemption arc definitely started with the Iron Claw and will only improve through the future along with the X-Men movies. Zack Efron will be our Scott Summers. We cannot have Scott Summers without Jean Grey. Now honestly, I think we haven't gotten a true portrayal of Jean Grey just yet. For the record, I really like Famke Jensen as Jean Grey, but it never really felt truly like Jean Grey. If we look at Jean Grey from X-Men 97 and the performance and the character-driven story that we had gotten, Fomka's portrayal just feels underutilized and more or less was used to replace Hank McCoy. In X1 and 2, Hank was entirely absent, minus a brief cameo in his human form in a blink or miss it scene. And Gene, for the lack of a better term, was his replacement. We got bits and pieces of Gene's story, along with the Dark Phoenix storyline, but never truly got the full thing. I'm going to be honest. Sophie Turner never really felt like Gene Grey to me either. I think she's a great actress and was incredible in Game of Thrones, but was extremely miscast in this role. Once again, her version of Jean Grey felt underutilized. But her story was also all over the place in X-Men Apocalypse and Dark Phoenix. I won't even be getting in the Dark Phoenix. The story was everywhere, and the Dark Phoenix storyline was adapted, just not adapted well, and I don't even want to call it that. For our Jean Grey, the Dark Phoenix storyline would have already taken place. We would be moving on to seeing Jean in her early stages of motherhood. The biggest question would be, who can really portray Jean Grey? I have two picks, the main one being Margaret Qualley. She's most notably from Once Upon a Time in Hollywood and mostly recently Poor Things. I think that Margaret is a criminally underrated actress and she already looks so much like Jean and in interviews is super confident, outgoing, and really feels like she can fit the role perfectly as Jean Grey. For my second choice, I would have to pick Victoria Petretti. Victoria is also from Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, but I first knew her as Love Quinn from You with Penn Badgley. Once again, another underrated actress, for me though, Margaret Qualley is our Jean Grey. I also think that she could bring a huge dynamic to the story as Madeline Pryor, and I would love to see it unfold on screen. Beast. Hank McCoy, aka Beast. Well, this one's easy for me. I'm not picking this actor because we share the same birthday, although I think it is kind of a coincidence. But I am going to be picking Kelsey Grammer. 
After the Marvels, it is clear to me that Beast needs to be fully CG. I love the full body makeup for Beast, but for us to truly get the real Beast, and for him to be a prominent character in the overall story, he needs to be full CG. Kelsey Grammer is also 69 years old, so I don't really think he would want to spend hours in a makeup chair, getting painted blue, and getting hair stuck to his skin. I love his voice for Beast, and I think that the one thing the Marvels got right was having him back as Beast, and also Beast being fully CG. I love Nicholas Holt, he was a good Hank McCoy, but the makeup and the inconsistent look for Beast, from X-Men First Class all the way to Dark Phoenix, was underwhelming to say the least. Matt Berry would be a second choice to voice Beast, but I'm mainly going to be sticking with Kelsey Grammer for this video. Rogue. With Rogue, I think it's a clear choice, but I do have an alternative that might even work better based on how critical this character will be to the story and the impact she will have. This version of Rogue will be nothing like we have seen in the eight live-action X-Men movies that we currently have. Rogue will once again be established, and she will have her ability of flight as well as her strength. For Rogue, my pick is going to be Riley Keough. She is most notably from Mad Max Fury Road and The Devil All the Time. I think that this casting is almost perfect, and I think she, as well as my pick for Gambit, will work perfectly together, but the same can be said for my second pick. That is going to be Elizabeth Gillies. I think she looks the most like Rogue, and truly is Rogue in my opinion. It's honestly a toss-up between her and Riley, but for my pick, it's going to be Elizabeth Gillies. She is perfect for this role and can really bring something special to it, if given the opportunity. Gambit. If it wasn't obvious already, it's Channing Tatum. After Deadpool and Wolverine, it's even more clear now than it was before. Channing embodied everything that I love about Gambit previously, and had only amplified my love for the character seeing him in Deadpool and Wolverine. I know one of the first few things that are going to be brought up about Gambit is his accent in Deadpool and Wolverine. I just want to make you all aware, everyone that had worked on the movie had said that Gambit's accent being unintelligible at times is part of the joke. That's how it's supposed to be for the movie. And if Channing Tatum were to get his Gambit solo film greenlit once again, the accent would be toned down for the movie. Channing Tatum has had a lot of similarities with Ryan Reynolds when it comes to getting his role of Gambit and getting a Gambit project made. Channing has been trying to become Gambit for over 14 years and has come close a few times, and he needs to be able to bring this character to light. Remy LeBeau was Channing Tatum's favorite comic book character growing up, and he wanted to make a more grounded Gambit movie set in New Orleans and be incredibly true to the character. Taylor Kiddish and X-Men Origins Wolverine had only gotten the role of Gambit after Channing was forced out due to G.I. Joe contract obligations, otherwise Channing would have been our Gambit back in 2009. I think Taylor Kiddish did an okay job as Remy LeBeau, but was completely underutilized once again. If you haven't caught on already, this is a running theme with the Fox universe and the casting that they had chosen. Channing Tatum not only deserves this role, but is destined for it. Charles Xavier. I think this is easily the best person that can play him at his younger stage in life. You gotta remember, this X-Men lineup will be roughly in their 30s. Ralph Fiennes and John Carlo Esposito are both great picks as well, and I think that James McAvoy did a great job, and so did Patrick Stewart. But, ultimately, I think that Ross Marquand needs to play him in live action. If you don't know, he was Aaron in The Walking Dead, Red Skull in Infinity War and Endgame, voiced Ultron in What If, and also voiced the Ultron Sentries in Multiverse Madness. Most recently, he had voiced Charles Xavier in X-Men 97. We need someone who can play Charles accurately for the next 10 to 12 years, as well as be age appropriate. I think that there's no one better to play the younger version of Charles Xavier than Ross Marquand. He's been incredible in everything that he's done previously and has only gotten better with each role he's given. Ross Marquand is our Charles Xavier. Kurt Wagner, aka Nightcrawler. Kurt is German, so it's only right to have a German actor portray him, and if you have seen Zack Snyder's Army of the Dead, Oppenheimer, or Army of Thieves, you would know that Matthias Schuver would be a perfect pick. Matthias is amazing in everything that he does, and I think he would be the perfect casting for Kurt Wagner in the MCU. This is generally a match made in heaven. Storm. Aurora Monroe. Storm for this X-Men movie not only needs to be truly shown as an Omega-level mutant, but she also needs to have her accent. Storm was once again extremely underutilized in X-Men Apocalypse, and I feel like it was a huge missed opportunity. I really liked Halle Berry as Storm as well, but personally to me, she didn't bring a whole lot to the character. Halle Berry never really felt like Storm, it felt more like Halle Berry was playing Halle Berry. This isn't a hit piece on her at all, I love Halle Berry, I just don't think Storm truly got the shine the way that she needs to. With that, I have three choices for Storm. This is the most choices for any character that I have on this list, and my main runner-up as Storm would be Dewanda Wise. Say what you will about Jurassic World Dominion, I'm a huge Jurassic Park fan, and I can't even stomach this movie. But DeWanda Wise was great in it, and I think if she was given the opportunity to give her all for this character like she had on Dominion, 
I think we would have the best storm in live action yet. My second pick would be Janelle Monet. She was great in Glass Onion, but she would definitely be a younger storm, and I think it could still work. And my third choice would be Anna Diop. I think the DC's Titans horribly miscast her as Starfire. Titans as a whole were not good, and I think that Anna Diop did the best that she could with her character, but the role wasn't for her, and it truly showed. She is another criminally underrated actress, and I think she could bring something new to the table as a Royal Monroe. My number one pick for Storm, though, would still be DeWanda Wise. It is the perfect pick, in my opinion. Magneto. For Eric Magnus Luncher, I think that there is only one man who could do this character justice as a semi-younger Magneto, and that would have to be Jason Isaacs. Jason Isaacs, although 60 years old, still looks young enough to convincingly play a Magneto in his early to mid-40s. I would think that he would bring everything he possibly can to this character. Jason Isaacs is the perfect embodiment of the comic book Magneto that we all know. The emotion and the impact that he could bring to this character would be out of this world. The Wolverine. You know how long I've been waiting for this? Who will play our MCU Wolverine? Keep in mind, this actor needs to be able to play this character roughly for the next 10 to 12 years. We've already seen him play Wolverine in live action. This is going to be Henry Cavill as the Cavalrine. Now, he wasn't my main choice, that still and will always be Taron Edgerton, but after Deadpool and Wolverine, I feel like Henry Cavill is the one person who should carry on Logan's legacy after Secret Wars. For the small cameo he took part in in Deadpool and Wolverine, I have 100% certainty that Henry Cavill should be our MCU Wolverine. As well, he was the only person that Sean Levy and Ryan Reynolds and Hugh Jackman had thought of to play any other variant of Wolverine besides Hugh Jackman. To conclude our cast for the MCU's X-Men lineup, it'll be... Zac Efron as Cyclops, Margaret Qualley as Jean Grey, Madeline Pryor, Elsa Grammer as the Voice of Beast, Elizabeth Gillies as Rogue, Channing Tatum as Gambit, Ross Marquand as Charles Xavier, Matthias Schuver as Nightcrawler, Dewanda Wise as Storm, Jason Isaacs as Magneto, Henry Cavill as Wolverine. Let me know what you think of this casting. I know it's not perfect, but I definitely have the right personalities behind these characters. The personalities of these actors is exactly why I chose them, they were picked due to how big of the impact they will have on these characters and what they can really provide to the story and overall how they can do justice to our beloved characters. With us now having the cast and our backstory to how the mutants will arrive in the MCU, along with our absolute point, aka our canon event, being Geonosha, I'm going to have to say that we're going to be adapting parts of the House of M storyline and that will be our building block into an Avengers vs. X-Men movie. We know that this movie will be happening, it is just a matter of time, and I think that Wanda should be partially one of the reasons, and one of the antagonists behind the attack of Geonosha. This would be a crucial part in getting us to the Avengers vs. X-Men point in the story. Wanda really didn't feel like a villain in Doctor Strange the Multiverse of Madness, if anything, the true villain of that movie was the story behind it. Michael Waldron is a great writer, and I'm so excited to see where taste Secret Wars, but we cannot ignore what we had gotten with the Multiverse of Madness. It was definitely a step in the wrong direction, but I think he also redeemed himself with Loki Season 2. That was the best piece of MCU content that we have gotten since Endgame, No Way Home aside. With that, Wanda's House of M story, I think would be really interesting to have adapted into the MCU, and we could also have a story in there as well with Magneto. Wanda in the MCU isn't Magneto's child, but in the universe that Magneto comes from, in this movie, she would be. It would be an interesting dynamic to bring into the story and to have it evolve with the characters. I would love to hear what you think of this take and where you'd want to see these characters go. If you enjoyed this video essay, go ahead and drop a like. I'd love to hear from you all in the comments down below and what you thought of this video. Joe from Jar Jar Jargon and I will be going live sometime this week for Cantina Jargon, our semi-weekly podcast, so make sure to subscribe and turn on those notifications so you do not miss when we go live. With all that being said, I will see you all in the next one. This has been Cantina Talk, signing off.